And Lord, those of us who put our trust in you, truly we will not be shaken because we are on the firm foundation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father, once again, as we open up the Bible, I just pray that we would see the great things that you have done for us. But Lord, also, correspondingly, I pray that we would see the things that we are to do in response. So continue to mold us into who you desire for us to be, that we would glorify you, Lord, in every aspect of our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And don't you turn to your neighbor and tell him, smells like garlic in here. <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be fist fights out there now. What? <laughs> Good morning, Jim. Uh, that's not so upsetting there. <laughs> it smells like garlic in here because we had our couples banquet last night and our couples banquet was a was a blessing. I want to thank everybody who helped. Jeff prepared the meal. And um, we had many servants, and I just thought it was just a really good time. Um, my wife, and she's mentioned it before, and on the way over here this morning, she said, I wonder what heaven smells like. You know, I wonder what language we were speaking. I wonder what heaven smells like. It could smell like garlic. You never know. If you're an Italian, at least, that's a good thing. <clears throat> Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. It's going to be a while before we get there, but again, if you arrived here today without a Bible, we'd like for you to follow along, and there should be one in front of you underneath the seat. But if there isn't, if you'll raise your hands, the ushers will bring one to you. Does anybody need a Bible? Well, good. You're becoming a church that acts like acts. Communion. We're going to be celebrating communion today, and communion is a time of remembrance remembering who we used to be, understanding who we are now, but also remembering who we are going to be in that time when we were with Christ. To think fondly back on your testimony on the day that the Lord Jesus Christ met you, that he became real in your life, and you invited him in, and he was faithful, and the great work that he started so long ago and continues to do even today. It's a time of remembrance. It should be a time of intimacy. Remember Ephesians and the book of uh, Revelation, the issue that the Lord had with that church, that they had forgotten their first love. Well, I was remembering and, and I was thinking. I remembering, well, I went into my living room and on the table next to the couch where I usually sit is my laptop. I opened up my laptop and I turned it on. The startup screen came on and it said, Pastor Mike. I name it Pastor Mike because that's my name, number one. Not a very complicated person here. Um, but also as I'm going into that realm, the realm of social media, the realm of the web and everything, that I would be reminded who I am in the Lord. But one of the folders that popped up on the desktop, and it's one of those things, if you're like me, every once in a while, and it's a great time, you know, just to go through the old pictures and the old memories that are there, some of the old ones that have been scanned in, and some of the memories maybe just even of a year ago. Well, on my desktop, I have this folder that is labeled My Life. And then as I double-clicked on that folder, it pops up, and a lot of subfolders come up. One of them is labeled birth, December 6, 1957. La Mirada years, that's where I pretty much grew up. Brea years, it's where I spent my high school years. La Habra was the first house that Terry and I had bought, and then Ontario. There was another folder, schools, elementary. It was Escalona Elementary School. Before that, it was St. Paul of the Cross Catholic School that I went to junior high school, Randall McNally Junior High School. High schools were two of them. There was Neff High School and then Bray Linda High School, and then there was college. Another folder there, there was work. There was the Catella Car Wash, the first job that I ever had. Firelight Alarms, I worked in their warehouse. J.C. Penney's, that's where I met my wife. 
Martinez, Hester, and Ryzen Electric, Krauss Builders, and then there was another folder that was the contractor years. Then there were various other ones, ministry, husband, father, son, and friend. And again, you click through those various folders of your lives and you're, you're confronted with, with memories. And a lot of those memories are good stuff, just everyday kind of a, st- of, of a thing. As I mentioned last night, Terry and I were pretty boring people, but there are memories and we cherish our, our memories. But what I noticed as I was clicking through those folders, there was a dark thread that went through all of them. All of these things from the very beginning, from that day of birth, all the way through, even to the most recent folders. And quite simply, it was sin. It was sin that had woven its way through certain areas of my life, really all areas of my life before Christ. So being a man of wisdom at the time, I remember when I was coming to the realization of that sinful thread, I would right-click on the mouse, and I hit the command on the desktop, new folder. And as it comes up, you get to entitle it, and so I entitled it Mike's Sin. So what I started doing is going through all of the folders of my life, all of that history, and I was dragging and dropping and dropping and dragging, and I was dragging all of the sin out of those file folders because I don't want anybody to ever see this. I don't want anybody to ever know because I know you guys all think that I'm perfect. And so... Three days later, I had a pretty fat file folder. And so I'm thinking, I'm pretty smart here. I'm going to get rid of this and it won't have to. Well, nobody will never know. Nobody will ever see it. And so I right click on that folder and I hit delete. But then this window pops up. This window pops up and it says files in use by other program cannot delete. So I'm thinking, what program could that possibly be? So I go over and hit the start button there, go up to programs, and I see the culprit program. It's called Accuser of the Brethren. Figured it must be a virus or a worm that had kind of wiggled its way into my computer, and it wouldn't allow me to delete the sin. And anything that I was even able to remotely get rid of, boom, it would pop back up, and that that stupid virus, that Accuser of the Brethren program, uh, was horrible. It was revealing myself for who I really was. All I could do was sit there and be confronted with my shame now because here I developed this folder. At least the sin, at least the sin was kind of hidden before, but now there it is for anybody who turns on my computer to see. But it's then as my sin was before me and I had to take note of it and to see all the ugly details of it, I realized that there was another presence in the room one that I noticed from the time that I had walked in, but paid little attention to, well, as I was going through those folders, paid little attention to through the majority of my life. And as I was sitting there, he asked for the laptop. He asked for that which was so precious. He wanted it all along, but I was never willing to give it up to him until I realized I couldn't delete that sin folder. And it's then that I heard his voice, and I realized, well... This laptop represents so much, but I saw the hands that reached towards me, and they were the hands of love. They, they had two, two wounds in them, and, and, and there was the stain of blood that was upon them. And as I noticed this, I was concerned at first. I was thinking about, well, the soiling and the staining that would occur, but then I realized instead of soiling and staining, there would be a clearing and a cleansing. And so... Finally, in faith, I trusted, and I handed it over to him. And again, I I, I was at the end of my rope. There was nothing else I could have done. So the first thing that he does, um, he, he was there by my side, and I was watching him, and he was doing this amazing work. First thing he does is he goes to that folder that I had made and drug all of my sin in, and he opens it up, and it's like, oh, I should have hidden that. I should have put some kind of password in, but if I was able to keep him out of that folder, it would have led to my eternal detriment. And so all of my crimes were open to him, and I just simply cried out, forgive me. But with all of my toil and transgressions before him, he went to work. And what he did is, he went back through all of those other files. There was a lot of sin that I had missed. There was a lot of things that, well, I didn't really want to 
I didn't really even want to acknowledge as being sin, but he went through and he did a lot more dragging and dropping and dropping and dragging and just made that folder even bigger than it was before. And I'm thinking, oh, great, this is never going to go away. Now, there it all is, the transgressions of my time, and it's right before me, but even worse, it's right before he who is sitting next to me. He's seeing me for who I am. I've built all of these facades up in my life. I, I, I've tried to hide all of these things. I had a better opinion of myself than really I should have, but now it's all open for him to see. But he now does a process that others have shared about with me before, but I've never seen actually transpire in my life. He right-clicks that folder that is labeled Mike's Sin, and I thought, oh good, he's going to be able to delete it. But he didn't delete it. He simply renamed it. And so he erases Mike's Sin, and he renames it, two words, the cross. He renames it the cross. And I'm thinking, well, what difference is that going to make? What good is that going to do? But then I just figured, you know what? Where Mike's sin used to be, now is the cross. It's the only thing that was going to ever deal with that folder is the cross, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's that which I'm not going to have to turn on that computer and see that stupid file there anymore. It's going to be gone. It's going to be cast away as far as the trash is from the desktop. Sorry, that's the best I can do in using this illustration. But with that, I, I realized the desperation I was in, but now the love and contentment that washed over me, although my shame could still be double-clicked for all to see. Well, with that, he went and he right-clicked the file folder, hit delete, and this time it was gone. See, the only way to ever delete Mike's sin is to first convert it over to the cross. It's when you convert it over to the cross that then it can be completely done away with. And it wasn't just that the file went away, it's that the shame went away. It's the guilt that went away. And as I said before, it's the contentment that came into my life. He even set up this one utility, it was kind of a neat thing, that any time in any of those other file folders or any of the future file folders, any time, like I left my cell phone on in the middle of church service or something like that would happen, <laughs> Any sin that I ever ha will commit, it would automatically go to automatic delete. It would automatically be done away with. Never would that sin be left to fester in a folder any longer. And I'm just thinking, this is just an amazing thing. And so he went, and he went to the start menu again. He went this time to settings, control panel, and he hit uninstall, and he did away with that one program, Accuser of the Brethren. So I wouldn't have to be bothered by that anymore. And so there was amazing freedom in what is going on. All of this done because in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not delete according to the flesh, but a delete according to the Spirit. And so it was all about this work which Christ has done when I realized that I could never do that work. He then sets down the laptop, and he told me it was time to go. And I was wondering, where are you going? He goes, I'm not going anywhere. I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. But I am going to go with you as you go forth in what I have called you to do. And so you are able to now go forth, Mike, because you no longer have to deal with the sin which so easily ensnares you, holds you down, and holds you back. That if you confess your sins, if you're faithful in that, I'm faithful to forgive. And, and, and so there was, again, this new confidence moving forward in the Lord and all that God has done. And so just before I left, he gave me one last thought. He told me that there are more file folders to be made. And he asked, based upon what I have done, what are you prepared to entitle those file folders? On the magnitude of the grace of God, which has been lavished upon you, what are the future file folders? What are the future things that you are going to do in your life? Communion? Communion is a time of remembering, and remembering the good things that God has done. 
that God knew the plight of mankind, that there was our sin, our sin was a stain, and there was not a thing that we could do about it. But since God understood that, God determined to do something about it. And he set aside, Jesus set aside some of the elements of his, his godship, if you will. He was still God, but no longer was he omnipresent, no longer was he all-knowing. There were certain things he didn't know that only the Father in heaven knew. And he humbled himself and became a man. And so we have fully God, fully man. Fully God and fully man. Fully man because he needed to die. Fully God because he wasn't going to stay dead. And the only reason he wasn't going to stay dead because it's only God who overcomes sin. It's only God who's able to delete sin. And again, communion, that time of remembering, remembering the good things that God has done. Remembering where you were. Remember how lost you were. Remember how, well, you probably tried to put it in the back of your mind to ignore it and to not have to deal with it because you were powerless to do anything about it. People shared the gospel with you, but you were unwilling because of pride to give yourself up, to give yourself over, I guess I should say, to the Lord. You refused to hand him the laptop. And even at times it felt like there was a tug of war that was going on, although he was never just going to rip it out of your hands. He wanted you to have a heart and trust and faith to give it over to him. Communion, communion, a time of remembering. As you hold those elements in your hands, remember the good things that God has done. Because we all have these file folders and we all have that same dark thread that goes through each and every one of our file folders. But the good thing about it is for the born again believer, it's been done away with, never to be brought back again. And so he said, it's time to go. And it is. It's time for the church to go forth to make disciples, to be a church that acts like Acts. And so, so far, what we have seen is, is that a church that acts like Acts, it's going to be evangelical. It waits on the Lord, is filled with the Holy Spirit, is moving and ministering. It is encouraging to the discouraged. It hates hypocrisy. It multiplies ministry. It witnesses as the world harasses. It is just like you. It has a call just like the Apostle Paul. It has a flow of fresh faith. And a church that acts like Acts, we'll just be looking at one of these today, but is prepared to preach. Is prepared to preach, is ready when the opportunity for ministry presents itself because God is always wanting to do a new thing. And the advertisings that I receive, and I've been to um, conferences, and there's workshops, and how to reach millennials. How do we reach millennials? You preach the gospel. You live the gospel, because the gospel is the only thing that is going to save them. We minister to people where they are at. We don't minister the same way that Chuck ministered, or at least in the same manner, because, well, it's getting really hard to find hippies down at the beach. You just can't find them anymore. And so, but Chuck did back in the 60s, and he ministered to them where they are at. We do minister to people where they're at, but what did Chuck do? He just taught simply the word of God, very simply. He taught verse by verse through the, through the Bible. And it's the Holy Spirit that works through that and touches the hearts of people as well. And so we have this this next dynamic, Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 20, and it's one of revival. And we'll say, I want to see revival happen. You first. You first. It it takes involvement of the church. It takes dedication of the individual to see that these things come to pass. And so Acts chapter 19, verse 11, you're going to see some organized religion, and you're going to see how Satan had his way with them, but you're also going to see how the Spirit overcomes. It says, now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. And so that these things are becoming well known. The Apostle Paul, there's something special about him. There's definitely the call of God upon his life. The believer would recognize that. Others didn't really know, and we've even seen some in the book of Acts who wanted that ability, but they wanted it apart from the Spirit of God. 
But God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchief or aprons were brought from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them. Now this wasn't because of the apostle Paul as the person. This is God working through them. Now keep in mind, this is the book of Acts. Things are just beginning. And so God does these things so that we would recognize that God works through people. What do we have today? We have the more sure word of God. But back then, we see things like this happening. Not that God does not do miracles today. He does do miracles today. There's no doubt about it. But he doesn't do miracles so much as we're sitting around and not doing what he's called us to do. When we become a church that truly acts like acts, it's then that we see the supernatural, that we see the miraculous. Verse 13, there's this group of religious people who are kind of looking on and want to They want to see the same thing, but they want to do it apart from God. It says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. These are exorcists that went out in kind of a road show kind of a thing. They were this traveling band of people who would go and exorcise demons out of other people, and they would do it for profit. And they weren't necessarily even exorcising demons out of people. They were just in it for the money. So, again, verse 13, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ through Pastor Mike. You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ through anybody. Your parents aren't going to get you into heaven. There's not a person on earth who's going to get you into heaven. It must be a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so they're trying to exercise control over demons through Jesus Christ, this guy who Paul knows. And so again, what we're told here and what's insinuated here is is that there is no personal relationship between these so-called exorcists and these demons in verse 14 and also there were seven sons of Sceva so here's an example apparently these seven sons of this man Sceva were were very well known he would be this man being a chief priest and there were seven sons of Sceva a Jewish chief priest who did so the chief priests at that time they were in it for the money as well they had the position and the notoriety and apparently this mindset was passed through to the kids that hey we'll go out and we'll exercise demons for profit and apparently they were well known so they must have did fairly well verse 15 and the evil spirit answered and said Jesus I know and Paul I know but who are you and the reason he says but who are you because he doesn't really care who they are they have no authority over him then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled outside the house naked and wounded. And anytime you try to do something apart from Jesus Christ, especially if you're going to mess around in the spiritual realm, you're going to leave the same way, naked and wounded, because we have no power whatsoever apart from Jesus Christ that is centered upon or has come about through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so one of the points I was trying to make last night is you don't have a power to have a a, a good marriage apart from Jesus Christ. I can't be an effective parent apart from the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that will enable me to do these things. I can't be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ without first being empowered by Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the title, the book of Acts, it's Acts of the Apostles, but we know that this is the book of the Acts of the Apostles who are filled with the Holy Spirit. In actuality, is the Holy Spirit working through these people. This is the work of the Acts of the Spirit. Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Because there's the difference. Fear, what are we able to do? These spirits, they're running rampant. We, we look at our society and the landscape of society, and there's fear that wells up. And there's a lot of people that add to this fear, especially with social media. The sky's falling, the sky's falling hard, and the sky's falling now. The sky's not falling. God's still in control. 
Nothing's going to happen apart from him. But we don't just ignore what's going on. We need to move forward in these things. And so again, it says, and fear fell upon them all. They realized their weakness, but it says, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. During this time of disobedience and even flat out heresy, God is still doing a good work through his people. Matter of fact, the word of God is even still spreading. Verse 18, And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burnt them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. This would be the wages of about 150 men for a year. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. And so I just want to look at this, this instigation of a real revival that had happened in that time. And it was a dark time because apparently demonic activity had increased. We see demonic activity during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ because every time God does a good work, the devil intensifies what he does. Jesus is crucified. Seemingly, the devil achieved a victory. But then the devil realized, no, this was a defeat for me because Jesus came back to life. And now, all of a sudden, what has he done? He's empowered his disciples with the Holy Spirit. The devil is wise to that and what that means. And so, again, he intensifies his opposition. And so my point here is, if you desire to be, well, Lord, if there's going to be revival, let it start with me. Well, then you're going to face the attacks. And it's been like that since day one. And even if the revival is just in your personal life, I guarantee you, if you
But the vote that I cast, the vote that I cast must be representative of the things that I believe. And so 